very well, welcome everyone. My name is Nicholas Tan from Kananga Futures Sundan Bahad. Thank you for spending your precious time to join our webinar today. Please take note that futures and options trading involves substantial risk due to leverage factor and may not be suitable for all investors. This webinar is purely for educational purposes. Kananga Futures Sundan Bahad accepts no liability whatsoever for any direct or consequential loss arising from the use of the content of this webinar. Before we start, we'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to uh, Karanga Features next webinar, which is on 14 July. It's about learn, uh, let's learn about futures. An invitation email will be sent to you shortly and don't miss out. Please remember to register once you receive the email. Next, if you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to post your questions through the q and box on the right side or at the bottom of your screen and he will attend to your questions after the presentation. Today, we have Mr. Brandon here, and he's going to share first a step-by-step -step guide uh, into CME soybean futures. So uh, without further ado, we'd like to kickstart our webinar today by welcoming our speaker, uh, Mr. Brandon. Thank you, Nicholas. Good, any, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Hope everyone is doing well. Stay safe, all right. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Kananga and Sammy for sponsoring and making this event possible. Because without both of them, without both of them, I would not be here uh, giving my sharing session. Without delaying, today I'll be talking about step by step into CME so I'll be futures. Okay, before I start, I would like to mention that whatever I share today is just for education purpose and my personal view on the markets. It does not represent any investment advice like giving any call or buy, buy signal, okay? So what I'll be doing today, uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing my professional trading experience. I think it's a very nice gesture from Kananga and CME for organizing this event. Because when I first started off uh, my trading journey, there wasn't a lot of sharing section, all right? Most of the event I went, most of them are just selling trading costs, you know, selling buy signals and buying, selling buy and sell signals. And then after a while, you think that they're just trying to make money from you. But what I found the most is, because, okay, because in my early stage, my trading career, I, I worked in a brokerage firm where I managed to expose myself to a lot of local participants, all right? Local participants, basically they are professional traders registered with the exchange in here is Busa. So they trade their own account. You know, back in the days, right? To be a local participant or to trade only account, right? You need to buy a seat in the exchange right now. Nowadays, you can just open an account with any broker and just trade like that. Back in the days, it's slightly different, okay? So from my, companies I was managed exposed to myself to all different kind of traders and thankfully most of them willing to share their experience to me I think those sharing sessions is what makes me I gain a lot of experience from Della all right and that's where I slowly honor myself skills you know because everyone see the markets differently so over time I developed my skills and my own belief on the markets then after that I went to Singapore for a period where I co-manage a commodities portfolio, commodities futures portfolio, okay? And there I learned how to do a proper risk management, all right, and how to do a sizable trade. Because it's very different when you trade 50,000 account or 1 million account, even if you trade 5 million account, it's totally different. How you position size, how much you leverage, how you take risk is totally different. At there, uh, what I do is I do a long short portfolio, commodities long short portfolio. So there are times where I buy soya bean, and short corn. So there are times where I short palm oil and buy bean oil. So it's quite interesting. So I'll be sharing some of these things today and how I use it and how and how I see it. All right. Basically, the uh, idea of the strategy is I need to buy winner and sell the loser. Like, basically. So currently, I am a trading manager in my company. Basically, I manage my company property trading desk. And the hedging desk. So most of the time I trade CPO, soya bean, soya bean oil, I trade micro Dow Jones, I trade nice micro nice stack, I trade uh corn also I trade. Lately I'm trading gold also. 
so I basically I have positions in all, sometimes I position all these all this commodities. Basically, I'm just doing a portfolio management of futures commodities. So I can trade anything I want, as long as it justifies the risk reward. All right. And out of there to make money, because like, it's my KPI. Like. Okay. Then I'll be sharing what method that I use today. Some of the things that I use, I'm, some of the things I'm using now. And after this session, I will give around 15 to 20 minutes to you guys free to ask me any questions 15 for 15 to 20 minutes. All right. Free to ask me any questions. That's where you learn. All right. I hope you guys ask more. So the agenda is I will talk about fundamentals that govern the soybean futures price. I think fundamentals is very important because fundamentals give you a bigger picture and the trend. All right. All right. The problem is most of the people, they do not know how to interpret the fundamental news. So that's what makes the difference. All right. Because most of the news that, you know, nowadays you see YouTube, you see uh, Bloomberg, those things. Some of them are just quite purely for entertainment purposes, just pure noise. Because they just say things for entertainment, just for television. All right. It doesn't really make sense. All right. Then, but most important, you need to know what kind of news that will move the market. All right. And this will take experience. I also will explain how to treat seasonality pattern, which is one of the most basic fundamental that you need to know, especially if you trade commodities, because seasonal pattern occurs over and over again every year in commodities trading, especially if you trade soya bean, uh, corn, crude oil also has seasonality, gold also have. So seasonality is one of the H I would say I use as my advantage to trade. I'll be explaining also trading opportunities in intermarket commodity spreads, all right? And why some people need to understand this to use it as an edge in their trading. Because a lot of people don't understand why you need to know inter, inter commodity spreads. Because if you know this very well, then you uh, use it as an edge. And that's why some people buy here and sell there. So let's start with soya bean. All right? When I first thought of soybean futures, when I first started in my trading career, I was like, am I going to trade tofu or soya bean milk? Because soya bean, oh, who is going to trade soya bean? I, know, I only know soya bean because of tofu, other than that, I don't know. But soya bean futures is one of the most traded commodities in the world besides crude oil and gold. And then uh, that's where I started to get interested. And soya bean is very popular in US country and China. So what are soya bean for? Let me go back to some of the basic. Most of us, like I said, most of us know soya bean just for the soya milk and soya tofu, but soya bean is high in proteins, which makes it one of the most major ingredients in livestock feed. Soya bean is one of the most important food staples and can be used for a lot of things because of, because of its high protein. And only a very small percentage only for use for human consumptions, which is like soya milk. Because okay, when you have the soya bean, the bean, all right, when you crush it out, 80% is for soya meal. What is soya meal for? Soya meal more is basically 90% for that is for animal feed. So basically your poultry, like your chicken, your cow, basically all they need is soya meal to eat for protein purpose, this way they grow faster. Only 3% is into soya meal and other stuff like tofu, beans, all right? Then only 20% crush out is to be soya oil. So when people buy soya bean, basically they want the meal, all right? 20% is soya oil, which is, we call it byproduct. It's just an extra. In fact, they just buy, they crush it into, oil, into meal, they take it, the oil, they just sell it for the secondary. So when you crush it to 20% into oil, 68% is of food, which is your cooking oil, vegetable oil, your margarine, your mayonnaise, it's all come from soy oil or palm oil. 25% is used for biodiesel, it's getting more and more, and 70% is used for painting purpose. So some interesting fact on soya bean, because when you trade CME future soya bean, you are trading most of the, you are trading the markets in the US market. So you need to know where soya bean planted. So I've been planted in the northern, we call it northern hemisphere countries like US, 
China, where is the top part of the world, all right? In Malaysia, we are middle, then you have Southern Hemisphere. To grow soya bean, you need to have a temperature between 20 to 30 degrees, all right? In Malaysia, you can't do that because Malaysia is too hot. So in US, most of the soya bean are planted in middle, Midwest, which is around this area. So now you know one of the things that will influence soya bean is this place called Midwest. So if I understand that if things happen in Midwest, most probably the soya bean price will, have a, will get affected. So I'll give an example. In 28, in 28 May 2019, all right, there's a very bad weather happening in Midwest. So once I have this kind of news, Normally, I know that, okay, in Midwest, if the weather is going to happen in Midwest, then I know that it's going to affect soybean prices and corn prices. And I like this kind of trade a bit more because this kind of trade, I would say, is 30% move. I'll call it 30% move because most of the time when you trade a market, right, 70%, if you notice that 70% of the market is very stuck, where it does, it goes up and down, you know, he, he has break out, then come back down or break down and go back up again. but when the market is easier to trade is when they have this kind of move. We call it, I call it the 30% move. When things happen, market will just move and it's, it's very trendy market. So when I read this kind of news right on 28th of May, right? So bad weather in Midwest, instantly I know soybean is going to get affected, all right? And true enough, the soybean price on the 28th May instantly just kept up, it will move the price, all right? Because when, once you have a bad weather in Midwest, which means most of the planting will get affected. Once the plant gets affected, you have less supply. When less supply, price will move. So one of the things is, I fundamentally they say the price will move up. All right, the next thing I look for technical. So on 28th of May, all right, this is uh, this is initial time, all right, it's good. When the market opened at, because in CME, I mean, in Swabian CME, it trades almost from, I think now it's a trade from 8 a.m. Then you stop at uh I think you stop at 8 15 p.m. then open back at nine something if you can't remember so so when a.m. the first thing is once the bad bad weather at eight o'clock in the morning instantly the market gap up all right so I like this country the most so uh, if you can signal right I will most of the day I will spend in front of the screen and just look for buy signal for this kind of market yeah. next I'll move to uh CME Futures contract spec. So a bit of technical side here. The full contract size is okay. One to make things because this one is quite technical, to make things easier for you. Okay, one thing you need to know is one lot of margin of to for you to trade one lot of soybean futures, you need around 1700 US dollar to trade one lot. Okay. One contract full value is 50 US dollar. Right. It moved by 0.25. So one thing it moved by 0 0.25. So one thing is equal to 12.5 US dollar. And then the main thing you know is you have uh, physical delivery. All right, that's very important also. Why people treat futures, so I futures because of physical delivery. So the trading hours is from 8 a.m. to 8.45. After it closed for a while, after it opened by 9.30, this is Malaysian time, open by 9.30 to 2.20 a.m. All right, this is current time. So how do you calculate? Because when you trade futures contract, you have to understand that when you trade a futures contract, it's a leverage product. So you need to know how much you need to leverage. Okay. So one futures contract is equal to 50 US dollar. So example, you sold one lot of soya bean November 2020 price at 950. So the, what is the full contract value? It's basically 950, there's a price times with your Future contract value 50. So the equivalent is this is the full contract size, which means if you buy one, if you sell one lot of soybean November, the whole full contract size is 47,500 US dollar. This is when you have no leverage. All right. Okay. So if the price dropped to 945, basically you gain 50 US dollar. How do you get that? Is basically Because if you move from 950 to 949.75, it dropped by 0 0.25. Because swapping contract moves by quarter, 0 0.25. Because it's based on bushes. 
So how much did you gain? Basically, one tech movement is 0 0.25 equal to 12.5 US dollar. So if you sold at 950, the price move up to 950.25, you lose 12.5 US dollar. If the price move down to 949.25, you gain 12.5 US dollar. I hope you guys understand this part. But most important thing you need to know is what is the full contract value? This is what is the price that you are not leverage, you're not leveraging about. So this is you need to divide to your equity so you know how much you leverage. So who's the biggest producer for soya bean? Interestingly, 80% of soya bean production come from three places only. United States, Brazil, and Argentina. In 2018, Brazil overtake US A as the biggest soybean producer by a small margin only. All right. In 2018, US produced around 116.45 million tons. Brazil harvests around 170 million tons. This gives you a rough, give you, just give you an idea how big is soybean is. In 2011, U.S. produced 3.097 billion bushels of soya bean. In 2020, means is now, uh, U.S. projected to produce 4.125 billion of bushels, which is a lot. And soya bean consumption is going to increase every year. It's going to non-stop uh, because, human, because of human population is getting more, so people will consume more. If they will consume more food, soya bean is one of them. Okay, this is just a rough pie chart for you have a look. So 34% is almost US to produce, and another 34% is to Brazil. But if the South America, if the South America, US, if the South America, Brazil, and Argentina combine, they actually they have taken overtaken US as the biggest producer. In 2011 moment, South America, which is Brazil, and Argentina have overtaken US as the biggest producer. And because Brazil is one of the biggest producer for soybean, Brazilian real, Brazilian real is the currency of if the currency of Brazil will have an influence in the, in the soybean prices. So one of the things I look for beside U.S. currency, I think Brazilian real is going to pro, will have a big influence on the Brazilian on the soybean price. As you see from this graph, you can see that once the current the Brazil currency start to devalue coming down, you will see the soybean price coming down also. Because the reason why is because now people can buy soybean, either they can buy from US or buy from Brazil. Because both of them are producing almost the same and both of them are competing each other, competing with each other. So Brazilian currency will have an influence on soybean price. So one of the things I look for when I trade soybean is when I look I look at this this pair of currency. Now, who's the biggest consumption? Who, who consumes the most soya bean? Without a doubt, China. China consumes the most. In 2018, cons Brazil consumed around 25 million tons. But in 2019, it consumed less. First, this is the this is the top 10 US export destination. Uh. Why China consumed less in 2019 compared to 2018? It's from 25 million to 10 million. The reason is because of trade war. But the funny thing is, what happened is, you see Argentina. Argentina suddenly become the yeah, export suddenly increased by two thousand over percent. Right. What happened is, what happened is when China have trade war with US, China don't buy from US but they buy from Argentina. So what happened is US export the soybean to Argentina. Then Argentina export sell it to China. So sometimes I think it's quite funny because right? even you ban it, right? People will find loophole to to buy and sell to buy to source a thing also. Since soya bean since the South America have become the biggest producer of soya bean, they also overtaken US as the biggest 
net exporter. Especially if you see from 2011, 2011 from this side, you can see that, you know, South Americans slowly have gained more market share compared to US. US is have reducing the market share. I think one of the reasons here because the sudden dip here and an increase in, in this South America is because of the trade war. Okay, this is quite important also. As China has the biggest population and the population will continue to increase, as you can see from this graph, you'll see that year on year, China import of soybean have been increasing over time. And it's, and it's to believe that you will not stop and will you just continue to increase. So this is the reason why when US have trade war with China, one of the things they like to use is soybean as for the trade, for the trade talk. Because they know that China need to consume a lot of soybean. Okay, for two, this is the graph for the soybean carry over stock in China. In this year, twenty twenty, due to the sudden COVID nineteen and uh, the economic slowdown and activity, the stock carry. The carry over stock in China have been dropped. You know, this this the red color is this 2020 have been dropped drastically. You know, suddenly just a big drop here. This due to the close down in China, especially Yuan Yuan Day. Since the reopening, China have been buying aggressively in so I've been a lot, you know. So then just stop pick up from here since the week 16 to now. And due to this point, China have been buying a lot, so I've been if you're not mistaken. All the soybean in China, all the soybean in Brazil have been bought by China, have been sold, sold already, mostly I think to China. And this only, this stock level thing is not only happening in soybean, but it also happened in palm oil also. The purple line is basically for this year, for this 2020, you can see the palm oil stock in China also getting reduced, getting less and less due to the COVID-19 and also the soybean oil. Stock in China also because of COVID, all right, so then stock activity, I think, right, become up quite a lot. And then start to go up again now. Okay. This is where I've been agriculture calendars. This is the planting period and when the harvest. This is one of the things that a lot of people do not know when the trade soil have been. I think it's very important. Okay, give you an example from April to June. This is where the China, uh, United States will do the planting. Okay. Because US and is it US, China and Europe we, we consider as a northern hemisphere country. This is where they start planting. This is then this is where the period they start to harvest. So country like South America is called yeah, the southern hemisphere. So during this period. February to June, all right, actually in February, June, this is where the planting is, and, they are, and this is where the harvesting period is, this is where the harvesting period is, this is where the planting is, basically the opposite side, all right, because of spring and autumn season then. So, like the example now, all right, in February until June, this is where the Brazil start to harvest the period. When start the harvest period, Brazil need to sell the crop. That's where the Brazil real currency will play an important role. Because once they start the harvest, all right, they need to sell. When they sell, they sell. If the currency start to come down, then the military comes down, they need to sell, sell. And it will influence the US CME futures or so. Then when it comes to September to October, that's when the US start to harvest, then the US currency will play, play a much more important role. One good, one good thing when you trade about CME future is you can monitor the planting progress. Okay. This is something that I I watch it over time. I think I this report I get it once a week uh, from USDA. You can just go to USDA or go to this NAS USDA. Because when you good thing about US market, right? When you trade them right, it's very transparent. You can see you can look for anything in Google and just get information from there. From this period, this is USDA, right? Basically you can know the crop progress and conditions. 
especially in, uh, in the Swabi in the United States for 2020. And if, the good thing is you can compare their condition, right, with different years, you know. Like in 2019, you can see the condition is quite bad. In 2016, the condition was quite good. And this year, our condition is quite good compared to the past four years. But one thing I like to look for is this, this period. Okay. okay sorry. Uh. You can see, you know, in US, right, the planting, is, the planting period is from April to May. So you can see that, you know, US, this, this line here is this 2020. This line, this, this, 20, this line is 2019, and this line is, two, is the average for four years. And interestingly, right, this year, right, US, right, have planted much way earlier compared to the past four years. Way earlier, I would say, because it's the average for the past four years, is the planting period for them. They start to start, normally they'll start at May, right, they'll go faster. But this year, the plan ahead. Why they do that is because China has signed an agreement with US that, you know, they, they will buy more soybean from US and they, they need to buy during September for the first phase. But what is most important for here is you need to look at the harvest period here. Normally, because when September, September time, they start to harvest, here is the start to harvest period. So if their harvest, you know, when if, if their harvest is like in 2019, the harvest is less compared to the average four years, uh, which means most probably is they really start to plant slower. They plant slower. The popping is okay, all right. But when it comes to harvesting period, is below compared to the last four, four years. Normally, it's, which means the which means the production is less compared to the last four years. If this happened, you will see the price during this period will be very supportive. If you know, you go back to look at the soybean price. I think last year, towards the end of the year, soybean price have got quite a good run because whatever they planted, the harvest less than they expected. So one thing I monitor most of the time, I look, I look at this, I look. Mostly, most of the time it moves. April and May is quite okay, but once it comes to September, October time, these things, this report will play a quite crucial role for me to know that are they producing as much as they think they would like to, or they're producing less. So I use quite a lot. Another thing I use quite a lot this is seasonality. All right. The gray line, this line is the average price for the past 10 years from 2019 to 2009. The orange line is basically your this year price 2020. So when you pick commodities, you have to know seasonality because it happens over and over over the years. From this part, from this chart, you can see that normally for soybean price, when it comes to July, it's always the peak. Then when it comes to end of September, it's always the bottom. So just just say that you're new to soybean futures, so you don't know how to trade and what do you think you should do. I think you should know, you should look at this chart and try to remember this. When it comes to July, you know, we're coming to July soon. Whatever you do is you do not look for buy signal, you look for sell signal to trade during July time. Because right? due to for the past 10 years, July has been coming down. So in July period, just look for a sell signal in July. And so I've been just try to do this. You, you try. Over the years, you see what the result is. And then when it comes to end of September, whatever how bad the news is, you know, about saying uh demand is not good or whatever it is, just ignore it, all right? Just look for bias in the at this period. You try to do this for 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 a few years, I think you will see the result and then you'll start to interest get more interested in commodity trading. Because when I first trading commodities, because there are so many communities in the world, you know, sometimes we also don't know what is the real demand supply sometimes. But what we do is we always look to society to get a better edge, you know, for us to understand what should we do. And one thing I like to trade when I treat a semi product is this thing called commitment of trade. I'm not sure how many of you guys heard about this because same is same exchange they are very transparent okay so what is commitment of trade commitment of trade is basically that you report to show that futures traders positions okay so what happened is example you open an account with Kananga futures 
So when you open an account with Canada Futures, right, you need to declare yourself as a retail or institutionist or agents. Right. So on Tuesday, what happened is CME will collect all the data on Tuesday. Then on, then on Friday, end of the day when market close, they will release this report to show that the futures traders' positions. The reason why they do this is to create transparency and find market position. Basically, you guys know, but the thing if you guys bear in mind is because they collect this data on Tuesday and release on Friday, this data is three day lag. So, but I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a good indicator as all those three days lag. So what you have in common in community on trade is basically your producer. Producer is basically like, uh, like your companies and production, basically their ages, uh, okay, their physical commodities. They also swap dealers. Swap dealers is basically uh, the banks, I would say the banks, basically take counterparty risks. Then you have managed money. Managed money is basically your, your hash pass, uh, all right, your commodities pool to operator, the others report. So I'll give you an example. And this, the best part is this kind of report is free. Okay. So what you can do is you can go to this thing called Trading Stars. All right, it's free. You go to this thing called TradingStars.com. Then what you can do is you just go to you can, all the products that traded in CME. Right, it's all it's all you have because in CME you have you know you have S and P five hundred, you have your treasuries, you have your cotton, you have your crude oil. And today we're just looking at cons, so we basically can go with the just coming out trade. So this is the over the weekend. So over the weekend, you'll see that you know producer have reduced the long. All right. In fact, they have also reduced the short also. Then you see value manage have increasing the long, and they're reducing the shots. But what I want you guys to know, see, is this thing called price and net positions. Basically, you can drag this thing up to past 10 years. Okay, let's go for four years from here, okay. So what I normally do is I, I just look for the green light. All right, green light is basically the money manager and I look for the swap producer, producer of the hedges. So normally I just look at these two extreme points only. For me, I give you an example from here. Remember, I just like this. Okay, this is example here. This period, this green point, this point, this green period, this extreme point. You can see that when the money manage start buying this contract so I'll be futures. Normally, at this point, they are at the max long already. All right, this is where they are the most, the position the most long already. So, which means that at this period, all right, at this period, they might not want. No matter how good, how many good news you have or well is, they might not want to buy. Add more long positions anymore because this is there for the past four years. This is the most max they can go. All right. So which means that any bad news happens, they might want to reduce their risk. So normally, if at this period they are max long already, money match max long already. Normally, I would not try to buy also because they, basically even they have good news coming in. So right, I don't think they want to add any more long positions they have because they already at the max long already. So any bad news, right? They might just risk off and come down also. Or sometimes if you are that low this period of time, when the money manage is basically uh, the most short position, see for, see for the past five years, this is the most max positions, most short positions really. So what I'll do is, if they are this period, they are for the past four years, right? This is the most max, they can go short, right? Which means they might not want to add any more short positions, which means that, if anything happened, they might do call back the position and they might do buy back the position from this period. So how you guys have asked me a few questions on this because this is quite important because I use I use this quite a lot, especially now. So all the weekend, sometimes all the weekend, you know, Saturday morning, first thing I do is I look into this thing called coming on trade. I will scan through all the communities. I'll scan through all the communities, so I've been so I've been all futures, you know, so I've been so I've meal. Uh, scan through corn, uh, scan through uh, coffee, sugar. Basically, I'll see what are the funds doing, what are the agents doing. So from there, I can sort of position myself, especially when you trade so I've been right. Remember, I showed the seasonality pattern just now. Uh, 
sorry. Uh, like, okay. Remember I showed you the seasonality just now? When it comes to June, July period, you see when it comes to June, when it comes to this period, July period, all right, when you see the funds start to short, you know, this short thing you start to short, and when start to start to work short, I will just, you know, I will just join them because you know when it comes to seasonality, right? When it comes to July, normally price should come down. So I'll go to I'll go to this thing and look, you know, money manage. Oh, they, they also the funds are also shorting in this communities. So if they start to add short, right, you give me a better commission that you know they're also shorting also. So I might just you know join them because at this period right, they still can go short because it's you know, this period go short. And when it comes to September period, at this period, the September period, they're shorting with it. Then I start to see that they you know they are start to reduce their the shorting positions. Then I know that during September seasonality price is at the low and it should go higher. So when you know this, I really know they start to cover back the short position. So which means that I during during that period I'll start to look for long positions. Because I really, they already start covering, then I start to look for long positions. So I use this quite often, especially when it comes to seasonality pattern also. Okay. Yep. So you can just go to the tradingstars.com to have a look. So for when you trade solar bin, you have something called USDA report on the supply and demand side. So it come out on the it come out on every already actually on every on the 12th or 11th of the month. Alright, come out this is uh this is this is Chicago time, so it's around 12 o'clock. Hey, I'm sorry, this is Malaysia time. Yeah, I think you mentioned this is Malaysia time. So this is one of the reports like in Malaysia Palma you have uh, MPOP data, all right, which means it tells you what's the stock level. So this report will influence the price quite a bit. Surprisingly, I don't know why they don't have in July, but they should have. So to me, on the 12th, 13th of the month, okay, you need to be aware a bit if you have positions. If not, you can just go to investing.com, plan economic calendar there, and just have to just Twitter and get this kind of reports. Okay, move on, I'll talk about spreads. So when you trade soybeans, there's one thing we like to call we call it old crop versus new crop spreads. Basically, in soybeans, all right, the old crop is January, March, May, July, August, September. Because in US, this is where the period is how they already harvest. Uh, they already harvest because they in US, right? They harvest during September, due November. All right, once they harvest ready, they start selling. Right? When they start selling, we call it old crop. Then the new crop we call it November because November is where they harvest. So uh, I use this quite a bit to gauge on how the on how the sentimental of the market is. Okay. So the orange line is basically okay. This example orange line is the July contract now, and the green line is November contract. So when you, when you say about old crop versus new crop, it's basically a calendar spread. So as you can see from here, this period, let's say this period. You can see that July prices is cheaper, means they're negative compared to November prices. So when this happened, basically I would say the stock for soybean is high because when the front month is much more cheaper compared to the back month, it's basically it's called continental market. So this is why the price is a negative. So when the price is it's negative at this period, I would say the stock is high. When the stock is high, basically most of the time market should not go up that much. All right, theoretically wise, theoretically calendar spread, theoretically wise, which means so at this period you can see that now this is a big engine. In fact, the spread is widened quite a bit to minus 12, which means this shows is a very bearish sign. Once the spread is become a more negative, right? I would say it's a bearish sign. If the spread is become a positive sign, positive with plus two, plus four here, this period. Which means there's a huge demand during November period. Which means it's a there's a huge demand during July. The no the narrow contract, which is a very bullish sign. So whenever the calendar spread is showing a negative sign, I would say the market is basically a, it's more to a bearish sign. So what is a contango market? So this basically this is a, how a contango market looks like. Basically, it's for soya bean. You will see that July prices is cheap, 
around, it's around 870, uh, maybe around 870. But you can see the normal price is 880, which means July prices is more, much more cheaper compared to normal price. But why is this happening? It's because Contango Hard Market is because basically, which means the buy, if buyer want to buy, you can just wait and buy. They doesn't have to buy the futures contract. They can just wait when it comes to the nearer month, it becomes cheaper and cheaper, then just wait and buy. And this happens is if the market is bearish. Yeah? All right, the rule of time is very simple. For the market, that's not a sign. And the price will have a resistance that should not be too, too supportive. Okay, the next topic is uh, inter-commodity spreads. So a new commodity spread is spread cons consisting basically a long position and a short position in different commodities. So this is what I do quite a bit. For example, here basically most people will just buy soya bean and buy palm oil and sell soya bean oil. But why? Okay. Because one thing you have to know that palm oil and bean oil basically they're both of them are purely com their competitor. People can Buy, because both of the usage are the same. Because both of them are for cooking vegetable oil, both of them can use for margarine, both of them can use for biodiesel, both of them can use for painting also if they want to. So they are purely competitors. So which means when people buy, they will tend to buy the cheap the cheap alternative. So in generally, palm oil is always cheaper compared to soy oil. For example, here the black color is basically the palm oil price at uh, oil prices. Sorry, peanut prices. The red color is palm oil prices. You can see the palm oil prices always cheaper compared to the peanut oil prices. This is spread between both of them. So, this is why sometimes you see palm oil market that they're quite sideways you know, because of when the palm oil is much more cheaper, right? Even market cap down, they'll tend to be more supportive. They give you an example from this period. Generally, palm oil and bean oil price differences should be around 80 to 120 US dollars, the difference between both of them. But interestingly, for last last year, last year in quarter four, there's one period where palm oil is price between palm oil and bean oil is the same. And I don't think this happened for how many years? I think for the past 15 years, I think it's the first time I see these things or so. The reason why last year when the palm oil price is that much going much more higher compared to the peanut price is because of the swine flu thing and, and trade war thing. If you know that what happened in last year in China is that this thing called swine flu, the hog swine flu. So normally China will buy beans from US for the soya meal. So the soya meal is to feed the hogs. So it's for the so when the hogs have swine flu. Basically, they do not need to have so much soya bean for the soya meal. So, but they still need something to cook. So, what they do is they come and buy the palm oil. So, there's a huge demand during last year, and this what happened become at this period. But it's very happened. If this thing happened, which means there's a good opportunity between palm oil and bean oil spreads. Because when palm oil and bean oil spread become even really right, people will normally tend to buy soya bean oil more compared to palm oil, especially India country or US country. That's so why once the palm and peanut prices go to even, all right, between both of them, if the if happen to me, so what happens is I will buy soya bean and sell palm oil yeah, at this period. At this period, when the price are even, I repeat, when the price are even, I will buy bean oil and sell palm oil. So the, once it's, once the price go back to sixty, I will earn the differences between them between both of them on sixty. So another thing you can look is the price difference between palm and peanut is when it reached to 156 US dollar. If this thing happened at this period, once the palm and peanut price spreads widen to 156 US dollar, what you can do is because palm is 150 US dollar cheaper compared to peanut. So what you can do is you can actually buy palm oil and sell peanut for this price for this strategy. Then once it's go back to narrow back down to around to let's say 100 US dollar, then you can earn the difference, the 60 US dollar difference here. Because at this point, 
palm oil is 156 US dollar cheaper compared to bean oil. So if this thing happen, the producer will buy palm oil more because palm oil is way cheaper. So at some point this period, like, palm oil is much more expensive compared to bean oil. So people will, the producer will buy bean oil more. So this is one of the way for the spread side of business, but this thing you need to do a bit of calculation for you to understand that what's between both of them, how big. Normally if it's too expensive, then what should you do? When it's too cheap, what should you can do on this thing? So another thing you have to always look is just weather again, huh? for us, okay. El Nino. In 2016, this is very strong and you know, I think I have my best here for in 2016 because of El Nino. So for El Nino, basically the peanut price to go up also. Uh, Brenda, is there anything else you would like to add on before we end the session? Um, I think if you, yeah, I think today you guys ask a lot of good questions also. I always say you guys ask, ask a lot of good questions. But what I want to say is, if, if you want to trade commodities, first thing you know is you need to know the seasonality, very important, okay? Then for you to trade the, this intermarket commodity spreads, right? Actually, you, not necessarily you have to buy one and sell one, you know? To, to, to fly for one dish, you know, okay. One thing you can use is especially for retailers or you want to get a bit a, a bit of age, right? Once the spread between example Nila, example my view, example if the price between Palm and Pina go up to 150 US dollar, okay. Normally at this period of time, Palm price will be quite supportive unless the soybean come down because we are much cheaper compared to Pinoy, all right? At this period, no most of the time already, right? So most of this, if this period happened already, right? Even no matter how bearish it is on palm oil also, right? Or market, right? It's quite hard to go down some more because we are so cheap already, unless Pinoy come, come down some more. So if you understand this extreme point also, right? Not necessarily you do the spreads, but it helps you on outright also. So you will know that, you know, at this period, palm oil should be a bit more supportive. At this period, you know, Palmer should, should not go high that much more anymore unless Pinoy Larry could get go up also. So this kind of this kind of point, right? It will help you know that is Palmer cheaper. If Palmer cheaper, is Palmer gonna be more competitive? If come with seasonality, does it helps me a bit on the seasonality also? If I understand very well, if we have a bit of advantage on that, and then you have to know weather very well. If you know weather, if you understand the weather very well, it helps you. For like example, you know, I only know, then it helps you also quite a bit also. You know, I think pretty much that's all here. All right, good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Should you uh, have any further queries, please feel free to drop us an email at bcrm.kananga.com.my. We appreciate yeah. you being here and uh, hope that you enjoy the webinar today. Please take a minute to rate our webinar and uh, your feedback is highly appreciated. Again, yeah, don't forget want, to register. Yeah. yeah, yeah really? so say, if, if you have any questions, you can actually uh, drop me your email to my personal email. This is my personal email. You can just drop me an email. Then I'll try to answer the question as well. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's good. Okay. And then um, don't forget to register for our next webinar. And thanks again for joining us and hope to see you again in our next event. Stay safe, everyone. And good night. What are you clicking? Click kanangafutures.com.my, Malaysia's leading derivatives broker.